So how's everybody doing? All right, recording is on. So Harrison, how are you doing? I'm very well, sir. I'm very well. Thank you. Good, good. All right. So let's pray together and we'll get started. Could I request somebody to pray with the class who would like to do that? So can I pray? Go ahead, Abhishek. Please pray. Okay. Heavenly Father, uh, we come before your holy uh, throne of grace in the name of Lord Jesus. Lord, give us, you give us new blessing and grace every morning, Lord. Thank you for that, Lord, and give us new opportunities. So, Father, bless the teacher, pastor, with your spirit of revelation, wisdom, and knowledge and understanding, and remove every form of distraction from this class that this class will go smoothly without any distraction and bless each of the student with a listening ear and an understanding heart mm. that we may understand what will be taught in the class and thank you for hearing this prayer in Lord Jesus name we pray amen 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 thank you once again good morning welcome everybody uh, we're talking about keys to supernatural ministry and uh, uh, this was this is an outline that we put in a in one of the earlier PDFs. So we're going, we're working our way through these eight keys. Uh, we've talked about understanding the realm of the spirit, about faith, the power of the word, the renewed mind, and we were talking about the anointing of the spirit. I will put out the PDF on that uh, shortly, maybe by next class next week. Um, and so you'll have everything that I've stated, the outline of what I've stated. Uh, we we'll just quickly review what we have discussed so far or shared with you so far on the anointing of the Spirit. I want to talk about that. And then we will move forward in talking about the next key, which is God's presence and glory. And I just want us to understand um, a, a little bit about the anointing, the presence, and the glory, and how we learn to move um, in these as we are instruments uh, to minister uh, to people, right? So the anointing, just to quickly uh, recap, review some of the things we said, and, and you'll find these in the notes that I put out. Um, so it's the presence, and the empowering the Holy Spirit working through a human vessel. So it's the Holy Spirit working through a human vessel. We refer to that as the anointing. The anointing reference refers to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And the anointing causes the mighty works of God to take place through the human vessel. Uh, it destroys yokes, heals the brokenhearted, and, you know, uh, opens blind eyes and so on. So the, the anointing is flowing through the vessel. So the key for us is to learn about the anointing, learn how to flow with the anointing because he works through us. We are human vessels. So we have to learn how to cooperate with the anointing, to flow with the anointing to minister to people. Uh, some of the things we said is number one, we said the anointing flows through us in line with God's grace and gifting on our lives. So you flow with the grace and gifting that God has given you the anointing flows through it, through the grace and gifting that's on your life. Use whatever it is. And if you're an artist, you paint. Uh, I mean, if you're, you know, and, and you expect that through your painting and expression of that gift, lives will be touched. If you're a musician, use that. If you're a person who speaks, use your speaking, whatever. The grace and gift that God's put on your life will become the conduit or the channel through which the anointing is released. The second thing we said also is that the anointing accompanies the word of God. So you know, engage with the word meaningfully, feed on it. Uh, the anointing flows through the release uh, of the word of God. And we act on the word. The anointing flows when we act on the word. You engage with the word, you act on the word, you become a conduit of the anointing. The third key we mentioned is consecration us consecrating ourselves as vessels before God. So God fills us up and then he releases the anointing through us. Uh, we'll talk more about consecration and as part of our personal preparation. The fourth one, 
we mentioned was expectation. That is, we, uh, we, uh, where there is heightened expectation for the supernatural, there is the flow of the anointing to cause that to happen. And so um, we slowly build up the expectation without hype, you know, without, uh, you know, becoming sensational about it. You know, try to be just normal. Because if you, you know, if we create a lot of hype and sensationalism, then people are going to think that, you know, oh, the anointing happens because of the hype and the sensational behavior. And then they're going to behave, they're going to do the, go do the same thing. But if you and I show that, look, the anointing is happening because you're expecting God to do it. And you can have expectation, be calm and, you know, just be calm and normal, and, but still be expectant. Uh, people then imitate that. They will be expectant without the hype and the sensationalism. Uh, so keep the focus on Jesus. Encourage people through the word and, you know, to expect the work of the anointing to take place. Some of the things um, we just mentioned in passing is that uh, there are different measures of the anointing. We gave example of Moses, the 70 elders, Moses and Joshua and Elijah and Elisha. So the different uh, measures. Um, there are different kinds of anointing. Um, now, when we say there are different kinds of anointing, we, had, we don't mean there are different kinds of Holy Spirit. No. One Holy Spirit who is expressing himself differently because of the channels or the conduits that he's working. So usually the anointing is labeled, that is we give a label to the anointing based on the gift and the grace through which it flows. So example, if somebody is teaching, we say teaching anointing, prophesying is a prophetic anointing, healing or healing anointing, same Holy Spirit, just flowing in different expressions. So we just label it according to the expression. That's all, that's all it is. You know, uh, it's, so we call it uh, different kinds of anointing, meaning the different expressions of the same Holy Spirit working, causing different things to take, take place. So the teaching anointing will cause revelation to come into the hearts of people, will bring uh, wisdom and understanding into the hearts of people, build them up and so on. The prophetic anointing, brings revelation. It uh, reveals the purposes of God, reveals the plan of God, reveals, you know, what's going on. So the prophetic has to do with a lot of revelation. There is the healing anointing, of course, results in healing, miracles, will, the miracle anointing will result in miracles. And, and, and as people, we can, we can flow in different kinds of anointings as the Holy Spirit, you know, moves us. And so we need to be sensitive to what kind of anointing he wants to express. So if, if you are a person uh, and that, 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 you know, let's say you, you could move in the teaching, you could move in the prophetic, you could move in healing some miracles, then you need to be sensitive. What does the Holy Spirit want to do through me now? And then you yield to that kind of anointing. So that's why it's important to recognize, okay, the Holy Spirit wants me to teach. So I'm going to teach now. Now is not the time to prophesy. Now is the time to teach. And through that teaching, he's going to express himself and minister to people. Or sometimes say, okay, the Holy Spirit want, wants me to prophesy. He wants me to move in this kind of, a, it's the same Holy Spirit, but you're aware of the kind of anointing, of the kind of expression he wants to bring through you. That's all we mean by kind of anointing, right? How he wants to express through you. So, so I feel the prophetic. I say, like, how do you know it's prophetic or teaching or healing? Well, you, you recognize it. It's depending on what he wants to do, right? If he's moving you that, okay, now you move on the prophetic. There's going to be that revelation. Then you just step into it. And you begin to minister that way because you're recognizing a prophetic anointing. There's revelation coming, revelation bubbling up. Uh, God is giving you you know, things that he's always revealing, revealing things to you. So you begin to move in that. If there's healing, miracles, you move in that, right? So the, um, uh, for us, we need to be aware that there are different kinds of anointing and you recognize the kind of expression the Holy Spirit wants. So then you know that's the kind of anointing that is flowing through you, okay? We also said that we can grow in the anointing we grow in the anointing, uh, we can grow, as we grow in our gift, as we grow in our grace, we will grow in the anointing, the expression of the Holy Spirit through our lives. 
grow in the gift, grow in the grace, you will grow in the anointing. And uh, towards the end of last class, last week, we talked about impartation. And yeah, now uh, impartation is, 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 is it's like a big thing. Uh, everybody wants to <laughs> receive impartation, but then we don't understand, you know, what goes into receiving an impartation. Uh, it is true that you know, sometimes impartation can happen, you know, this through this, somebody just laying hands on you suddenly and it happens. Uh, that's the exception. The norm is impartation takes place through association, that you are drawing through a certain person who's carrying a certain gift and anointing you're drawing through their life you're receiving through their life and along with that comes an impartation of gift and grace and anointing right and usually the impartation takes place aligned to god's gift and calling on your life so if god hasn't really called you to that kind of ministry there's no point in pursuing that because hey that's not the call of god on your life you know so pursue the anointing that's aligned to god's gift and grace and calling on your life. Uh, impartation can take place in a measure. It doesn't mean everything that one person carries is, you know, dumped on somebody else. No, usually there's a measure, there's a measure, there's a certain aspect of the anointing. And uh, ultimately we said, whatever you receive comes from God. So even if a God uses a person to lay hands on you and impart, ultimately it comes from God and you are accountable to God for what has been imparted into your life. And we also said that whatever is received through impartation has to be nurtured and developed, right? So just because somebody imparted something in impartation, does not mean auto, you know, overnight you become like that person? No, an impartation is a deposit made into your life, but that has to be nurtured and developed in, in, in you, right? So uh, just a few more thoughts on the anointing and then we'll have some type of question answers and then we'll move on to the next key, which is presence and glory. Uh, so just some more thoughts on anointing before we move um, is that we must learn how to administer the anointing or some people use the term flow with the anointing, right? And now Jesus used language like this. He said, you know, he who believes in me out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Uh, and this he spoke of the Holy Spirit, John chapter 7, 37 to 39. So, so the anointing flows like a river, right? So that means uh, you and I need to flow with the anointing. That means move in the same direction and move with him the way he is moving right so that's we call it as flowing with the anointing right so when you recognize the flow of the anointing that is the presence of the father holy spirit being released through you what must we do we must administer the anointing that means the holy spirit is seeking expression through you he wants to be released through you he wants to flow out of you you know, to use the biblical language, flow out of you. But in order for that flow to take place, we have to flow with him. So it's not like I am passive and he's active. No, I have to be active with him. I have to move with him in order to release his presence and power into the lives of people, right? And as I move with him, there are typical ways by which we administer, that means we release the anointing uh, to bless other people, whether it's an other individual or whether it's a congregation or whoever you're ministering to. That means we call that as administering the anointing. That means you're releasing the anointing from your life, through your life, to touch somebody else. What are some of the keys? What are the simple things we must keep in mind when we're administering the anointing? Right? Uh, first, of course, is faith. Right, faith is important. I must be in faith. That that, that you know. So if I get into un unbelief, it's going to hinder the flow. Right. So I must move in faith while I'm ministering the anointing. So I recognize the anointing, but I must move with it. Example: If you recognize the prophetic anointing coming on you, you've got to step out there, ready to prophesy. 
Now, how the Holy Spirit wants you to prophesy or release that prophetic, and you, know, you can vary, right? You have to be sensitive to it. Sometimes he may say, walk up, go up to that person, prophesy. Sometimes he may say, call that person out, come up. Sometimes it, he may say, just go in that direction, and you start walking in that direction. And then he says, okay, go speak to that person. Right? So, but that all of that action takes place because of faith. So I can recognize the flow of the anointing. I must flow with the anointing, but that means I must move in faith. So faith is in, involved when we are administering the anointing. That's letting the Holy Spirit flow through us to touch somebody else. You've got to, you, I, you and I have to step out in faith. And then when we're releasing the anointing, the anointing can be released through a touch. So sometimes you lay hands on people. You may touch them. Uh, sometimes you don't have to touch them. Sometimes just speak a word. So the anointing can also be released through your spoken word. You know, like we said, Jesus, he said, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and life. So you might just speak the word. You must, you know, release it as a prophetic word, or you may you know, say something, which the Holy Spirit wants you to say, be healed, be delivered in Jesus' name, whatever. So the anointing can be released through touch, your lay hands, touch, it can be released through the spoken word. All right. Uh, it can be released through some prophetic action. You know, so I may not be touching a person, I may not be speaking a word, but it could be some prophetic action. I mean, the Holy Spirit is telling me to do something, you know, and, 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 and this could vary, right? There's no set actions. What do the Holy Spirit lead you to? Sometimes you just wave at a person. Sometimes you may move your hand a certain way or whatever, right? There's a prophetic action. The Holy Spirit is saying you do this in order to release the anointing. And you see examples. But for instance, you know, uh, there was a time, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking back into Second Kings, I think it's in chapter 5. Uh, and there are many examples of this. I'm just mentioning this example right now for prophetic action. Um, Elisha was with some of his people he, whom he was training, and they decided to build a hut, you know, build huts next to the bank of the river. So they decided to go and chop wood, sticks or wood to come and build. And as this man was using his axe, the axe that came off the, 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 the handle fell into the river. And so the son of the prophet, meaning he's a trainee prophet, he says, alas, my Lord, it, it was borrowed. Meaning this is not even my own. I borrowed this axe from somebody and now the axe head is in the river. What does Elisha do? He takes a piece of, he takes a stick. He asks him, where did it fall over oh, there? He throws the stick. See, none of it is logical, right? In the sense, like, well, you're throwing a stick, and what's going to happen? He throws a stick, and then the axe head comes up and floats. So God is at work, but he had the prophet do a certain action. In this case, it was throwing a stick. Now, I'm sure Elijah would have thrown lots of sticks <laughs> at different points in time for various reasons. Nothing happened. But this particular time when he threw a stick into the river, the axe had, the axe had actually came against natural laws to begin to float on the river. And it came to this guy and this prophet, some other prophet, and he takes the axe head to himself. So this example, like this, you'll find many examples where there's some action that, that the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do. And that releases the anointing. In the case of Jesus, you find him you know, there are times he laid hands on people. There are times he spoke the word. And there are times he did some weird things, like he spit on the ground, made clay, and put it on people's, somebody's eyes. That's weird. I mean, he didn't do that all the time. Sometimes he touched the tip of the tongue. Now, that's different, but he did it. Right? So uh, the anointing, as you're administering, you're moving in faith. Sometimes you lay hands, sometimes you speak a word, sometimes you do an action, something the Holy Spirit tells you to do. It's very specific for that case. You do it. And the, and the, and, and the fourth 
thing that, that, that you must also keep in mind is that the anointing is also uh, released through materials. We, we see this in, uh, in the case of uh, Paul, uh, even the life of Jesus, uh, through, you know, Paul laid his hands on uh, cloth, uh, Acts 19, verse 11. It says, God worked unusual miracles through the hands of Paul because aprons and handkerchiefs were taken from him, taken to the sick, and, and they were healed. Now, in that case, God used cloth. But there is no restriction that God can only use cloth. He can use any material that he created. So sometimes you, 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 know, you find the Bible using anointing oil. Uh, it's just, just a material. You can, God can use water. He can use anything he wants to. Uh, John G. Lake, in his ministry, uh, uh, they recorded uh, the fact that uh, they used to pray over uh, newsletters. So in those days, they printed newsletters. So people used to pray over the newsletters, and they used to mail it out. And when people received those newsletters, they were healed. They were they experienced a miracle in their lives. And so John G. Lake believed that uh, God was using these newsletters as a material to transmit the anointing and, and touch lives. So, so many different ways that God can use to administer the anointing, right? So you and I have to be open. Faith, you can touch, you can speak, you can act, and God could use certain materials as well to minister the anointing, okay? And lastly, our last point I want to touch here is, um, you know, keep in mind there are certain hindrances to the flow of the anointing. The number one biggest hindrance is unbelief. Uh, and, and, and you read about this even in the ministry of Jesus uh, in Matthew 13 and in Mark 6. When Jesus went to his own hometown, it says he couldn't do many mighty works. He healed a few sick people. But he couldn't do many mighty works because of their unbelief. Mark chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. Because of unbelief. Was Jesus anointed? Yes. Was the Holy Spirit upon him? Yes. Could the Holy Spirit flow through him? Yes, but nothing big happened. Why? It tells us because of their unbelief. So unbelief stops the flow of the anointing. Right? It hinders the expression of the anointing. And so that's why we need to create an atmosphere of faith by the ministry of the word and worship and so on. Right? Another hindrance to the anointing, uh, for the flow of the anointing from our side would be unwilling to step out. So the Holy Spirit is prompting. The Holy Spirit is telling you to go, move in a certain direction. And you and I are like, oh, I don't want to. It's too much of a risk. And if we don't take risks, uh, nothing's going to happen. right? So from our side, our unwillingness to step out, our unwillingness to take risks can become a hindrance to the flow of the anointing. And we were quenching the Spirit. That's how the Bible says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Right? Don't suppress. Let Him flow. You flow with him so that he's able to minister to people. And a last point would be the works of the flesh. So if I am motivated wrongly, at some point, the flow of the anointing will be quenched. So let's say the, 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 the Spirit of God is flowing through me. And then I suddenly begin to take credit for myself. Ah, look how wonderful I am, this, that, and all. Look, I'm moving in the area of the flesh, uh, of self, of... Uh, pride, you know, those kinds of things. It quenches the flow of the anointing because God said, you know, uh, in Exodus 30, he said, do not put the anointing on man's flesh, saying that, look, don't use this to, this is not ordinary, this is precious, right? He said, my glory I will not give to another. So we have to be careful. So the things of the flesh can come in and quench the flow of the anointing. Okay, so... Uh, I've covered several things here uh, on the anointing, trying to just condense uh, things for us here. Uh, the key for you and me is learn to be sensitive to the move of the Holy Spirit in your life because he wants to express himself through you. That's the flow of the anointing. Any questions now before we move into number six, key number six, which is presence and glory. Okay, now let me introduce key number six, which is God's presence and glory. So 
anointing, presence, glory. These are all terms that we hear and they are biblical. They are in the Bible. It's all referring to God, but it's expressing a different way of his operation to touch the lives of people. The anointing is God working through a particular human vessel. He's working through a human vessel. The presence of God is God dwelling among his people. It's God extending himself among his people, his presence. And it can happen, you know, his presence can come on us as individuals or his presence can come upon us as a community, as a group. But it's God extending himself. We have a part to play in receiving from his presence. So we need to be sensitive to his presence and receive from his presence. So when the presence is released through an individual, the presence in past released through an individual, we say anointing. When it's released, you know, over a person, or over a community, not depending on any individual, they're saying it's presence. God is, God's presence is here. And the glory of God is a tangible expression of that presence. So all three, anointing, presence, and glory, is God expressing himself, but it's in different ways. And we, in order to receive the supernatural work of God, must learn how to flow with the anointing, with the presence, and with the glory. Respond, how to respond to the presence and the glory. So we have uh, talked about the anointing, which is the presence of the Holy Spirit working through you as an individual. Now we want to talk about the presence and then we want to talk about the glory, right? Now, we have a APC book called The Presence of God. It's a simple, small little book um, talking about the presence of God. But what we do see in scripture, so you can take that off of our website and um, you can study more. Okay, here's a uh, you can study more about the presence of God. Now, but let me just summarize. So what is, so God is omnipresent, right? God is omnipresent. That means he's present everywhere. So like the psalmist said in Psalm 139, where can I go from your presence? Where can I flee from your spirit? Where can I go from your presence? So God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. But people generally don't experience God because of his omnipresence. So God is everywhere. The presence of God is everywhere. That means people should just be falling down everywhere and you know, repenting. That doesn't happen. When two believers are gathered together, God's presence is there. Jesus said, if two of you gather together in my name, I am there. So Jesus is present. But two believers can gather together and they can fight with each other. They can be, you know, mean to each other. Well, they gathered in the name of Jesus, but they're... <laughs> So what happened? The presence of God is not making any difference in their lives. Jesus is there, but they're fighting. No effect of God's presence. But then, there are times when the presence of God can come on an individual or a group of people and lives are changed. Seek are healed. People are set free. The Bible says, 
the hills melt like wax in the presence of the Lord. Even the hills melt like wax in the presence of the Lord. But then you've got situations where two people are fighting in the presence of God, the, nothing is melting. How do we understand that? Well, we must recognize that there are varying levels or degrees to the presence of God. There is the omnipresence of God, but no sinner bows down and just converts or turns to God because of the omnipresence. God is present, but they don't even bother. Believers can get together in a church setting or a fellowship and they can be fighting, arguing, being mean to each other. Jesus is there, but there's no awareness of his presence. No sense. And yet, there can be a higher degree of his presence where people are overwhelmed and lives are changed. So the point is, there are varying degrees, varying levels of the presence of God. And I think the best analogy for that is, and I use this often, is when we think about temperature. So, temperature. There are varying degrees in temperature. So, at a, you know, at uh, whatever, 50 degrees centigrade, Iron doesn't melt. Some few things melt, but iron doesn't. Take the temperature up to 100 degrees centigrade. Some things melt, others don't. Take the temperature up to 250 degrees centigrade. Something melt, some things melt, others don't. And then you can take the temperature up to several hundred degrees. And at some point, metal starts melting. So what are we saying? We are saying that depending on the degree of the presence of God, we will see things happening or we will not see things happening. But there are varying degrees to the presence of God. The potential is always there that hills will melt like wax in the presence of God. Psalm 132 is a very powerful psalm, a beautiful psalm about the presence of God, about God's dwelling. And in that psalm, God is saying, where, where I am present, I will meet the needs of the people. I'll feed the poor. I will clothe my people with salvation. I will give them victory over their enemies. Uh, there will be the light and revelation coming in. That's in the presence of God. All this can happen in God's presence. Psalm 132. I think it's verses 12 to 14. Uh, maybe somebody can read that just to give us a little context. Others I'll keep talking and not giving scripture. So let us at least read one verse passage of scripture today. Uh, Psalm 132, please. Verses 13 to 18. Psalm 132. Can somebody read it for us, please? Can I read, uh, Pastor? Please go ahead. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has decided for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall flourish. Mm, thank you. So notice, 
is talking about the place where God is present. He says, you know, uh, Zion, Old Testament Zion, New Testament church, Zion means God's chosen people. So God's saying, you know, among my people, I will dwell, verse 13. This is my dwelling place. This is where I am going to be present. I'm going to dwell among my people. Verse 14, this is my resting place. So God is here. God is resting. And wherever God is resting, what will happen? He says, verse, verse 15 to 18, this is what I will do. And notice what I want to highlight here is, and if you can just go through this passage and just underline every time God says, I will, I will, I will, I will. In other words, I am there, I'll take care of it. My presence is there, this will happen. In the anointing, you and, I are there, you and I are flowing together. In the presence, God is doing it, but you know we have a part to play in, in, in hosting the presence and welcoming the presence, in recognizing the presence, in accommodating and welcoming and, and receiving the presence of God. So it's like this, you know, let's say uh, somebody came to your home um, you know, somebody very wealthy, somebody very, you know, who, who's come to bless you. He knocks on the door. Now, if you and I, if we don't open the door, he's not going to come in. So the presence came but we didn't accommodate. So he's still outside. Or we can recognize the presence, open the door. Yeah, the person comes in. And then we are off in some other room, busy doing our own thing. We still won't get the benefit of his presence. No. So oh, God's presence is here. But then we get caught up in our own thing. And so what happens? We miss out on receiving from the presence. Whereas in Psalm 132, God says, look, I will do all this where I am, where my presence is. I will bless you. I will, you know, I will bring provision. I will provide for the poor. I will bring salvation. I'll bring joy. I will bring strength. I will bring light and revelation. I'll bring victory over enemies. I'll bring honor on your life. All this is there in the presence of God. But sometimes you open the door, the person who's come to bless us has come in and sat down there. Then we leave the press, leave him there, you know, and then go off into some other room. We're busy doing something. So what happens? We don't receive from the presence. But in the presence of God is the supernatural which we just read here, Psalm 132, meaning all the things that, that we need to meet up our needs and, you know, everything's listed here. Salvation, joy, strength, anointing, revelation, victory over enemies, honor in our lives. Everything is there in the presence of God. The key is for us to learn to receive from the presence of God. So, it can happen to you and me as individuals. It can happen as, you know, when we come together and as people to worship the presence of God. God extending himself to where we are. He's omnipresent. But remember, there are varying degrees to his presence. So, We have something to do with that. The more we say, God, I want you more, the more we hunger and thirst for him, the more he comes in his presence. The greater the degree of his presence over there. Right? And then 
when the presence of God is there, we must learn to receive. Learn to receive. So that's important. Now, in the Bible, and you will find this in the book, The Presence of God, simple book. The presence of God is uh, typified for us in different ways. The presence of God is like rain. The presence of God is like fire. God says, I am a consuming fire. The presence of God is like light. Uh, the presence of God is like honey. Or we said water, rain already. So there are different pictures of the presence of God. And each has its purpose. Rain brings refreshing. Rain causes fruitfulness, brings reviving. Fire. Fire consumes. It destroys. But it also rekindles, invigorates. Light. Light dispels darkness. Light exposes the dirt and the sin and all of that. The light gives us direction, guidance, revelation. Honey. It's, it's, it sweetens our lives. It blesses us, heals and strengthens. Like this. So the point is that when you recognize the presence of God, you also recognize what he has come to do. What does he want to do? Because the pres presence of God is various expressions, various purposes there. So when over you as an individual, sometimes when you're praying, the presence of God may come on you. How you respond to that will determine whether or not you receive what God came to do for you. Right? If I just, ah, oh, I feel so nice. Thank you, God. I will miss out on what he wanted me to do. I may recognize his presence, but maybe he came to give me a revelation. He came to speak something into my heart, but I got so excited about his presence, I went and did something else and I missed out on the light that he wanted to give to me, the revelation he wanted to bring. I missed out. that visit of his presence lost its purpose. Sometimes it can happen to us as a group, you know, maybe two or three or five or 10 or 100, 200, many hundreds are gathered together. We are worshiping and worship is one of the ways we invite the presence of God. The Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. So God is moving in and he's extending more of himself the degree of god's presence is going up then what happens people get all excited but that's the time to pause that's the time to be very sensitive what has he come to do has he come to heal has he come to speak a word has he come to melt evil like wax as he come to burn the chaff, as he come to expose the, the dirt, whatever, what has the presence, why, why has he come? And we have to be sensitive and receive from the presence of God. Otherwise, the purpose of that visit is wasted. And so we yield to the presence. We yield to the presence. And the point is this, that when we yield to the presence, things happen in the lives of people. 
And this is different from the anointing because the anointing is flowing through an individual. This is not coming through any individual. This is God moving as he desires through his presence. But we must respond. And the presence is, in, is um, what to say, it's not something visible, right? There is no visible expression of his presence, but you can recognize. So the presence is recognizable, but not visible. So what do you mean? I'm not seeing it with my naked eye, but I can recognize. Whereas the glory is a visible expression of his presence. So that's the difference between presence and glory. The glory is a visible, tangible expression of his presence. And the glory, we will talk about it next week, is God just putting himself on display, moving sovereignly. Whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. In the presence, you and I have a responsibility. We have to receive from his presence. It's not visible, but you recognize it in the spirit. So when somebody says, I feel the presence, uh, it's not necessarily you feel it in your body. Now, sometimes it does, you can feel them in your body and all, but it's in a spiritual recognizing. You're aware. So you're spiritually recognizing his presence. Glory is different, it's tangible. So there's anointing, there is presence, there is glory. Uh, I've just tried to share uh, you know, some things about the presence of God, but here's the wonderful thing. When the presence of God, when God is releasing his presence amongst us and we become sensitive, you and I don't have to do very much. Just tell the people to receive. And in the presence, people will be healed, people will be delivered, needs will be met, emotional, physical healings will take place. We, there's no human person doing anything. And the anointing, yeah, it's following through a human person. The human person has certain responsibility, has to minister, lay hands, speak the word, do this, do that, okay? In the presence, God is doing the work. We are learning to receive. We must recognize his presence, then respond to that presence. Then we will receive. So this is where, you know, if you're an individual, if it's happening to you individually, it's where you and I must be learned to be sensitive and just receive. If it's happening to us collectively, like in a setting, in a group setting, the leader, usually, usually, it's the leader who's responsible. He should say, hey, the presence of God is here. God has come to do this and this. Please be reverent receive. That's all. The leader doesn't have to lay hands on anybody, he doesn't have to, dip, you know, nothing. This is the presence of God at work. So example, there have been times, and uh, I know we have just a minute or so, there have been times that, uh, you know, when we, we have sensed the presence of God during worship. Then we just left everything. That means no preaching today, no video announcements, nothing. We are just going to stay with the presence of God. And I, and I remember some occasions, uh, this, I'm not saying this happens all the time, but I remember some occasions where, you know, we, we have an order of service, right? We have a plan. The plan is 40 minutes of worship, then transition into, yeah, say some announcements and then get into the ministry of the word. That's the usual plan. If you have two hours or one and a half hours, whatever your service time is. There have been times when we started worship, we began to sense an increased, a heightened presence of God. And we said, just keep going, just keep going. 
and we end up with three hours of continuous worship. Nobody complained, nobody left, everybody was just caught up. And in that time, later on you get the testimonies. People are healed, people are delivered, just, just God is doing it by His presence. I mean, nobody's doing anything. Sometimes you may call out and say, there's a healing presence of God, receive your healing, or there is God is delivering His people. Or you may recognize it and you say it, you know, just to encourage people to become aware of that. But most of the time, you're not doing anything. You're just pursuing the presence, responding to the presence. And God is doing, like we read in Psalm 132, He said, I will, I will, I will, I will do it. So God is doing it. We are just responding and receiving from his presence. Okay. Um, I have to stop. Time is over. Uh, I see Rose's question. Let me read it. Would having a vivid vision when communing with God in prayer or worship be classified under the expression of God's glory as we can undeniably see what is shown and God showing us something? Yeah. So you're saying a vision, prayer. God is, yes. So a vision, you know, a vision, yes. So I would answer to your, the answer to your question is yes. Okay, it's an expression of God's glory. That means God is, see, unlike the presence where it's recognizable in the spirit. You're aware, but you know it's not the natural. It's not like you can't see it. The glory of God is what you can see. Uh, I'll, I'll just, I know our time is over, but I'll just give you a scripture, Isaiah 40 and uh, uh, verse 5. Isaiah 40 verse 5, it says, The glory of God will be revealed and all flesh will see it. So the glory of God is God making himself known in our natural world. The presence of God is God moving in our natural world, in our world, but you have to recognize him in the spirit. But the glory is different. The glory of God is all, when you study the glory of God, it is God making himself visible in some some way in the natural world so that you know uh, we see we see it it's revealed okay but that's also an important key to the supernatural so we must learn the anointing learn the presence how to move with the presence of god how to receive the presence of god and then the glory. Okay, we we'll talk about that next week. The mistake, and let me close with this, the mistake people make when they begin to recognize the presence of God is they, they disturb that. You know, if somebody, like we go back to that same analogy, somebody's coming to your house, they have come to speak to you, they have come to minister to you, they come to bless you. But you get so excited, you make noise, you, you know, then the person says, I'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs> and they leave. Or, you know, or whatever, you know, you get, you get distracted and fail to receive what the person came to do for you. Okay. Any questions before we close in prayer? Okay, everybody's really quiet, so I don't know whether this is making sense or <laughs> it is making sense. Uh. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Thank you, Harris. <laughs> Samuel is contemplating. Okay, <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, yeah. Let these things settle in your hearts, and and, and I'm sure God will help you experience it. Uh, 
both personally and corporately. Okay, sounds good. Let's close in prayer. Just want somebody to uh, lead us in prayer and then we will dismiss. Well, let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Father, we bless your name. We thank you for the opportunity you've given us, O oh God, to hear your word this morning, this afternoon, this evening. We thank you because your word, you know, bringeth light and added no sorrow. Thank you, Father, because you've revealed, O oh God, more of yourself to us today. And we pray, Father, that you will help us, O oh God, not to miss it in the when you speak to us. Mm -hmm. We pray, Father, O oh God, that you will give us, O oh God, that discerning spirit, O oh God, to walk accordingly as the Holy Spirit leads. Father, we pray that you will give us, O oh God, the grace, O oh God, to operate in that supernatural dimension that you have proposed and destined us to operate on. I pray, Father, that the words that we've heard, O oh God, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, shall not just drop void, but Father, let it be an impartation to every life, so oh God, that is present here this day. And I pray that, Father, even as we go out, to oh God, into the street and to every nation, to every city, to every tribe, Father, manifest the fullness of your power. Mm. We glorify your name because we know that we are moving forward and not backwards. Mm. I thank you. I want to use this opportunity to thank you for our pastor and his ministry. That, Father, it will grow from grace to grace. We pray that you will strengthen him from time to time. Mm. And for all the hearers of God, Father, they shall be, O oh God, a product, O oh God, of this ministry. We bless your name, O oh God, and we give you all the glory. Thank you, Abba Father. For in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being uh, on the call today, on the class today. God bless you. And, uh, yeah, thank you. See you again soon. Enjoy your afternoon and rest of your day. God bless. Thank you, thank Pastor. You, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Viola. Thank you. Thank you.